So, uh, welcome. Uh, I have with me Mark Maxim, uh, Director of Platform Software at Lacuna and Ellis Associates. Um, I'm Sean Roberts, Chief Technologist for uh, Lincoln Network, and this is Lincoln Shorts. Um, thanks for joining me, Mark. Um, so, um, we were just talking about the OMF and what the OMF is and, um, and your, uh, your work with it. Um, this gives you some, uh, you being a developer that's been in open source for a while, I have some experience in this field as well, but I think I, I have a little bit of feet in both, uh, both areas, a little bit in policy as well. Um, I'm really interested in your thoughts on um, what's going on right now with big tech and the antitrust actions, but more specifically, your perspective as a developer um, there's been some discussion about, um, and actually I, I was um, talking to somebody else specifically about this, that um, it, one of the typical approaches in the past has been to try to um, uh, mold big tech behaviors through consent decrees. Um, how do you think, uh, well, from your perspective as a developer, how do you, what do you think about that? I think there's an incredible mismatch between innovation in the context of technology and good governance. Innovation is constantly on the move, right? Which right. means that by the time regulating bodies have recognized that there's some sort of a problem, they're fighting the last war. If you come in and tell Facebook that you have to be able to change the filter in some fashion, they've already changed it. Uh, if you want them to be able to delete your data, they've probably already done that in response to uh, user requests. Maybe, maybe not. Um, some more examples, uh, you know, Google favoring its own shopping or Amazon or what have you. By the time you get there, it may or may not still be a problem. And it's difficult to fight a war on quicksand like that. And the war is in the interest of the consumer because the you know, companies don't necessarily have the consumer's best interests uh, at heart. So I really worry about antitrust because you know, while I'm really put off by monopoly behavior, you know, uh, and I, I hate to sound like a libertarian here because I'm not, uh, but oftentimes the, you know, the, the, the cure is worse than the disease because of this incredible impedance mismatch between the constantly shifting terrain of the marketplace, of the tech companies, uh, and the uh, you know, sort of necessarily slow and methodical and um, you know, uh, plotting approach to you know, setting up what hopefully be like you know, laws that persist for more than a year or two years or whatever. Um, you also have, I mean, I'm going to divert a little bit here. You look at AB5. AB5 was a really aggressive piece of legislation on behalf of California, mm -hmm. you know, allegedly for Lyft and Uber drivers. But because they couldn't just write law that targeted Lyft and Uber, they wrote this very overarching uh, notion about what's a contractor and what isn't. And there was all sorts of collateral damage. And the legislature started immediately writing exception after exception after exception to where AB5 was just full of Swiss cheese. And then Lyft and Uber went and spent $200 million or so to get a ballot measure passed that sounded like an entirely reasonable thing. Oh, we should allow those people to work their jobs however they want to work their jobs. That sounds reasonable, right. doesn't it? And it passed overwhelmingly. Uh, it passed part. overwhelmingly, and it is a horrible piece of legislation. I don't think anybody actually read it uh, that wasn't, you know, a wonk in Sacramento or somebody that works at one of these companies. Um, right. It carved out a very incredibly specific labor law. It didn't fix the gig economy. It only addresses Lyft and Uber and DoorDash and these related delivery services. It didn't do anything for sort of the other victims of AB5 who now you know, can't work as flexibly for whatever reason. Like um, freight riders, for example, right. as far as I know, right. they've gotten nailed by Right, them. there's right. all kinds of people that have gotten swept up in AB5. So I think now that, you know, AB5 has been, you know, essentially neutered by Lyft and Uber, which, you know, the precedent of, of being able to buy legislation is really not good. Um, talk about uh, conflicting interests between, you know, sort of this public good, you know, versus private, you know, company interests. 
uh, AB5 should be thrown out now. It, uh, like AB5 is totally toothless in terms of what it was originally intended to do. All that is left is the unintended consequences, which is sort of what started me on this whole rant in the first place. Is unintended sure. consequences are, you know, it's, they're so hard to avoid. Um, the law and regulation is very slow. And it, you know, by the time you get through, you know, speaking to staff, the staff coming up with uh, something that for lawmakers to look at, they hold committee hearings, and whether it's at state or federal level, you're at least six right. to 12 months in. And then they start debating what the law should be, and then the lobbyists get involved. Right. So you're two to three years right. in at least before anything right. is done. And to make modifications, right. if it's written a little bit too specifically or poorly, um, I mean, when does that ever happen? Right. <laughs> Hardly ever. <laughs> Instead, well, I know. They, put, they build in exceptions, or maybe they pass another law that accepts um, accepts it. So, kind well, and, of the situation and here. Legislation Colorado. is so complex, and the creation of it is so complex because of the competing interests. And I have, you know, friends and family who work in lobbying, and you know, the they say that you, you never want to watch that sausage being made, and you know, often as not little tiny individual clauses will get into what might otherwise be a reasonable piece of legislation that are just complete non-starters, either to make it you know, unpalatable to the state or unpalatable to the companies involved where they don't have any choice. A moderate solution, a clean solution might be reasonable. And then somebody overreaches and says, oh, but we also want to slip in, say, some you know, privacy legislation here that makes it impossible for the state to meaningfully regulate anything these companies do. You know, like in the name of privacy, which is often, you know, like privacy is it's like QAnon and pedophilia. You can't possibly be against pedophilia, right? You can't be possibly be against privacy, right? But to say, you know, that we are not allowed to have states have access to data about say, you know, the movement of scooters or Lyfts or Ubers or what have you, while those companies have obscene amounts of data in terms of not only you know, the basic movement, but your credit cards and your you know, listening to your GPS position, your phone and all sorts of crazy stuff. Like the hypocrisy of it is really deep. So being able to share that with their own apps that are, that are right? making money. I mean, and potentially sell apps. that to advertisers or third party agencies. You know, Maybe they do, maybe they don't. It's always in that fine print that you click through when you're just like, hey, yeah, I want my ride. Right. Um, you know, use a specific example. So, so, um, so I, I kind of mentioned consent decrees, um, and yeah. generally, my experience has been, uh, or my my understanding is, consent decrees are usually about when there's an acquisition of um, a smaller company of a larger company. That's usually the way it works. Um, yeah. at least, uh, where I've been in Silicon Valley, or we where we've been. So, um, what's do you have an opinion um, or thoughts about how if if let's say um, the federal um, justice department got more aggressive. Um, they've been relatively hands off um, for the acquisition of, of smaller tech by big tech over the last 10 years or maybe even the last five. So if they got more aggressive and they started slapping on consent decrees on, you know, thou shalt do X, Y, Z, do you think it's any different than kind of passing a law or regulation that it's, you know, kind of too late or do it provide some relief? Well, I think that it's the same fundamental problem of incompatible, you know, sort of timescales. Mm. Um, you've got tech companies moving rapidly, um, and you've also got this lack of visibility into the future. Sometimes people will, like, you know, make a huge amount of noise about, you know, oh, if we allow these two companies to join, then it's going to be, you know, price Armageddon or whatever it's really hard to know that in advance, you know, like how many airlines is the right number of airlines? How many scooter companies are the right number of scooter companies? You know, like, you know, people are like, well, consolidation is bad. I'm like, I mean, sometimes for sure. Like you don't want oligopies. Well, I can't pronounce the word. Um, you know, uh, oligarch. <laughs> no, that's different. Um, <laughs> you don't want, you know, small number of companies to basically just completely own a market. I mean, we all know that uh, competition is important. But if you had, say, a hundred Ubers instead of one, would that benefit anybody? Really? I mean, probably not. Like, I'm not going to install a hundred of those freaking apps on my phone. You know, right. like, economy of scale is a real thing. So the, 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 the problem with like legislators sitting back and saying, I see a problem, I'm going to fix that problem, leads to 
incomplete or inadequate or just flat out wrong solutions that undermine people's belief in the notion that anything can be done. And I think a lot of the sort of you know, anti-government you know, sentiment uh, running around uh, in the country and you know, to different degrees the world um, is a reflection of you know, a lack of expertise, but not just a lack of expertise, a lack of humility mm-hmm. around how legislation and regulation is approached. And that's, I wanna come back to the OMF really briefly, sure. is that I think the OMF is the perfect example of how bringing together in a neutral-ish playing field, uh, the different parties and sort of working it out and pre-negotiating things in advance to where nobody on any of the sides, plural, sort of unilaterally says, this is how it's gonna be. Um, You know, you don't wanna give, you know, the states or the cities or the feds too much power, but you don't wanna give the companies too much power either. And um, another little, you know, sort of my own little political stance on this is the like, very overgeneralizing here. The right is really worried about government power and the left is really worried about corporate power. And I'm worried about power. And I think that in the same way that the government itself has checks and balances, I think everybody needs to be sort of checking and balancing everybody else as Good much point. as possible. So that's an excellent point. Well, that's a great, great place to, uh, to end this part of our discussion. Um, this has been Lincoln Shorts. So- Thank you.